Hey, everybody, before we get into today's episode, I wanted to remind you folks that I got a bunch of solo gigs coming up in August. I'm going to be at the Hot Monk Novato on August 17th at Old Princeton Landing in Half Moon Bay on August 18th at Moe's Alley in Santa Cruz on August 19th and down at the Belly Up in Solana Beach on August 24th. Venice West in Venice, California on August 25th, and Tambler Brewing in beautiful Bakersfield, California on August 26th. And we might be adding a matinee show to that gig I'm doing out in Chicago on September 14th with Jim from Pennywise in the side room at Fitzgerald's. So if you couldn't get tickets to that, uh, we might have something for you here coming soon. Get all your tickets at chrisshifflettmusic.com. And while you're there, you can pre-order my new record, Lost at Sea. It comes out in October, but we've put together some fantastic fantastic bundles for you we got colored vinyl we got football scars fishing lures coffee cups we got everything you could possibly want so get them now before they're gone and uh, let's get to today's episode thank you oh, f- oh that's not it. I think without question, my favorite part was this thing. I love that. Hey, what's up, everybody? This is Chris Shiflett. Welcome to another fine edition of Shred with Shifty. Got a great episode today with Rivers Cuomo from Weezer, but first we got to do a little housekeeping. As you know, this show's brand new. and We're still finding our footing, figuring out how to do it. So I want to get some feedback from all you folks out there watching. Tell me what you like, what you don't like, and we'll uh, adjust accordingly. So get on over to my socials and, and leave me some notes. I've also been taking questions Uh, For the guests, I'll usually post, you know, when I'm interviewing somebody and if there's something specific you want me to ask them, shout it out. Let's hear from you. And also, don't forget to learn the leads, post videos of you playing them and tag me on it and tag Shred with Shifty as well. And uh, maybe we'll review some of those at a later date. And make sure you follow the show at volume.com slash Shifty, where you can get all the full video episodes so you can learn these solos right along with me. If you don't already know, I got a new album coming out in the fall called Lost at Sea. There's a few songs out now. Go check them out. There's lyric videos, live videos, whatever you want. Go click the links below. Give it all a spin. And get on over to ChrisShifflettMusic.com, where you can sign up for my email newsletter, Shifty's Tackle Shop, and we are going to send you a brand new unreleased track right to your inbox. Check it out. Today's guest is Rivers Cuomo from Weezer, and he's going to be breaking down the outro solo from Only in Dreams off the Blue Record. Now, anybody that follows Rivers knows he's always worn his old school metal influences on his sleeve. And I know he can rip, but I got to warn you, you're about to see him let loose his inner Malmsteen beast. This guy knows how to shred. So let's get to it. This is Rivers Cuomo from Weezer on Shred with Shifty. Feel free to stop me if there's some kind of technical problem or even if I'm just like contradicting myself. And (laughs) (laughs) If you're contradicting yourself, buddy, we are definitely not going to stop the interview. That's what we do. That's (laughs) podcast gold. I... I, I've heard that I do it a lot. <laughs> Directly <laughs> contradict myself five minutes apart. <laughs> no, no, way. that's not going to happen today, buddy. Welcome to the show, Rivers. How are you? I'm awesome. I haven't uh, seen you in a minute. What's been going on in Weezer land? Well, we put out four records last year. Um, I, dude, I was going to say, look, just getting ready for this interview, I was just going back and looking at your at your catalog. You know, I know we're... We're focusing on Only in Dreams off your first record today, which is an, an oldie. But my God, you guys put out a lot of music. How do you how do you do? Do you have like a clause in your record contract like that? Your label's not allowed to push back on you putting out like 100 records a year. Well, yeah, we don't really have a label. I think that's the problem. <laughs> so our, our manager is just like, OK, as long as as long as the music is good, keep going. Um, but I think I think we've learned a lesson like. 
there's only so many new Weezer albums the world can take in, in a year. So um, we're going to take- what, what is that number? What's the, what's the optimum number? Well, I mean, we've been looking at these other bands like Fall Out Boy. Um, they didn't put out a record for five years. And then when they finally get around to putting out an album, it's just like a huge deal. So I don't know if we can wait that long, but um, maybe, maybe a couple of years, build up some demand. Nice. Listen, since we're focusing on an old song of yours today, uh, it got me thinking about about the good old days when I was a young buck living in Hollywood. Um, and I think we're about the same age. And I'm, I'm pretty sure we moved to L.A. around the same time. I moved to L.A. at the beginning of 1990. Um, I'm not yeah, sure. Yeah, I was 89. Exactly. 89. OK, so, yeah, so roughly the same time. And that was an interesting period in the L.A. rock scene where like, the 80s in L.A., and I grew up not too far away, so I was coming down for shows all the time. The 80s was, like, booming in L.A., and I moved here when I was 18, thinking, kind of expecting it to still be that, and only to find that that, that scene had really died by then. And it was a, just before the sort of grunge alt-rock explosion of the early 90s, but that was bubbling up. And so all the, it seemed like most of the bands playing in the clubs were, like, some hybrid mix of Jane's Addiction meets the red hot chili peppers funky metal you know kind of thing going on and and there just wasn't a much of a scene and then you guys popped up and you were total like this breath of fresh air that was totally different than everybody else like i'm i'm curious to like what was what are your memories of that time in LA and the and the rock and roll scene here well i guess i got there about a year before you and it was still booming and i just had the time of my life i i moved from a small town in upstate connecticut and went straight to the Sunset Strip with a, 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 a pile of 500 flyers from my band, my metal band. And, you know, we just went there every weekend and had, we had so much fun in that scene. Um, but, but yeah, I, I remember one weekend the cops came and they just kind of pushed everybody out. And from that point on, it was, it was pretty much dead. And the band broke up. A bunch of guys went back home to Connecticut or wherever. And I got a job at Tower Records, which was an amazing education in music. And I, I got more into the one up on Sunset. Yeah. Oh, wow. I got into alternative music and that and that's how I met uh, our drummer, Pat Wilson. And we, we formed a band, which, as you said, was like Jane's Addiction, uh, kind of like almost like pre pre grunge. And um, it. <sighs> We're just kind of figuring out who we were going to be now as alternative rather than metal. Well, so, so that's a really interesting thing. You, you have worn your sort of heavy metal influences on your sleeve pretty much from the beginning. But I always wondered, um, because, you know, obviously that's a part of Weezer sound, but there was all that sort of 80s college rock and into the alt rock thing in the early 90s. Like, who are you listening? Who are your big influences that that from that, not from the metal thing, but from the more like college rock sound? that influenced and impacted your songwriting for Weezer? Cause that just doesn't seem like something that could happen that fast. You know what I mean? Like you must've been listening to both for a long time. It seems like. It happened really fast. Oh, really? <laughs> it kind of <Okay>. happened, kind of <laughs> happened overnight. Um, and not just for me, but I feel like so many people, in my generation, like one day we're listening to like Striper <laughs> <laughs> and Metallica and uh and then just kind of overnight we like we all cut our hair and um started listening to Sonic Youth and I know the Pixies were were huge for us and um but Jane's Addiction maybe was the first one because it was like okay there's there's still big guitars here I can I can kind of get into this well, it's funny when you look back at that time, because clearly, like, when you see Dave Navarro playing, like, a whatever, you know, I don't know what it was, a Charvel or something with the hockey stick, like, th that, those those worlds overlapped quite a bit in actuality. Yeah, yeah and, but, and but Perry Farrell is just, like, so far from being metal. He's, like, he's, like, the, the pure alternative leader, and it was just... It's like this Pied Piper that, that kind of led us all from metal into the alternative world. And it was such an exciting time. I remember, like, I saw you guys, and this would have been the very original version of Weezer with your original lineup. I saw you at the Central and just yep. was like, whoa, what? Who are these guys? Like, there was just nothing else that sounded like that. But to the point that I remember being, like, shocked that 
when I heard that you guys got a record deal, because it just seemed like not that you weren't good or didn't deserve it or whatever, but just it just didn't seem like anything was like coming out of L.A. anymore at that point. There was one band before us that were they were kind of like our big brother band. Um, they were called Wax. They used to oh, yeah. No, I'm, that's so funny. Joe Sibb's like one of my best friends in the whole world. Yeah. So they were a huge influence. One of those guys worked at Tower Records. Um, and they were like a year ahead of us. So we watched them get their record deal and they all came to our first show and we just kind of mooched off them and said, Hey, t- teach us everything, you know, and they kind of helped us tr- make that transition from, from metal through Jane's addiction all the way to, to being this alternative band and different, you know, introducing some new guitar styles that their guitar player was really good, but, um, a very different style from what I grew up playing. And, uh, and also giving us all kinds of business advice and everything from like, all right, you, you don't make your flyers on eight and a half by 11 sheets anymore. You just make these little <laughs> rectangle ones. You know? yeah. And it's just way cooler. Yeah. I don't know why. L- learning your way around the Kinkos was, yeah, that was a right. Yeah. I will tell you the very first time I ever went on tour, first time was uh, I was roading for wax. So that oh was my, my first, God. that was my introduction to the touring life. And I was hooked. Amazing. Yeah. 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 I loved wax. They were so much fun. Those shows were great. Like a yeah, and stuff. unbelievably yeah. fun. Yeah. Another important thing that influenced us at that time, uh, not just turning to the alternative bands, but looking back to the sixties, that's when I discovered the Beatles and the beach boys. And I got interested in melodies and, and lyrics and all this stuff that had nothing to do with shredding guitar. And also just admiring the, the style, like the, the clean cut look and, and like even the Beatles would, would be wearing ties and suits. And I was like, whoa, that's so cool. You know, on that tip, who who do you just aside from guitar playing, who do you sort of look to as your your biggest like uh, some of your bigger lyrical inspirations or influences? Because you've always had a very kind of like specific style to what you write. Mm, I'd say on, on the one one hand, I, I just love really s- simple, direct, honest emotional lyrics. Um, I, th- I think Pet Sounds is, is one of the best examples. I was super into that around the time we were making our first album. And I know you, th- you think of, of Brian Wilson, but actually this, this random guy wrote all the lyrics on that album. His name is Tony Asher. He's some like, oh, really? young advertising executive that just like he and Brian became friends for a minute and they wrote that album together. But he, he did the lyrics. Did he, he ever do anything him. else? Like, I don't think he know- so. That's insane. <laughs> I know, but the lyrics are so good. I mean, you write the, the lyrics for like the, the entire <laughs> record for what is considered by a lot of people to be like one of the greatest records that ever happened. And then you never t- do part two. And not that I know of, Jesus. Uh, but I, they're just so pure and uh, no, not trying to do, not trying to be cool or intellectual or anything. They're just like, this is, this is how I'm feeling right now as a young guy in LA. Well, let's back up a little bit and get into uh, your origin story as a guitar player. How old were you when you started playing guitar? Well, it's the end, the end of eighth grade. Some of my classmates did a performance of Metal Health by Quiet Riot. Mm. And I mean, I couldn't believe I was seeing people I knew my age with electric guitars, drums, bass, playing that song that I love so much, Bang Your Head. And I, I just knew that's what I had to do. So I was, that yeah, was a was big working. record, big yeah. record. That was a real defining record for me. And that's what made you want to pick up a guitar. Yeah. So I, I got a guitar for my birthday. What kind? It was a Strat copy made by Yamaha. Uh-huh. I didn't know anything about gear or amps. So I, I, I knew what I wanted to sound like. More importantly, I knew what it, I didn't want it to sound like. Cause that time you'd go to, go to a guitar store and, and you'd come home with like a, an amp that didn't have any distortion and you'd like clink, <laughs> right, clink. And yes. This doesn't sound right. <laughs> Those early days of learning, like where I, before I understood how to tune my guitar, even much less how to make an amp sound right. You know, where you're like, this, this does not sound like Randy Rhodes at all. Kids today have so many more resources. <laughs> all these like basic questions are, are easy. To These get damn kids today. <laughs> how dare they? Um, all right. So, so you, did you start taking lessons? Like, did you take a lot of lessons? Were you a disciplined guitar student? I took, I took some lessons from a, a very cool guy um, named Jason Cole in Connecticut. 
and he was just a, a very alternative thinker. Like he would tell me, he'd show me all the, the like the pentatonic scale and, and like the metal riffs I wanted to learn. But then he'd say like, man, did you hear this Madonna song? The guitar playing is so cool. And mm. I was like, what, 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 what are you talking about? Madonna? And and I'd listen to it. I was like, oh yeah, that's actually kind of cool what the guitar player is doing. So he just kind of broadened my mind. I, I don't know. I did maybe 10, 15 lessons. And then from that point, it was just, just learning songs by ear or the various um, guitar magazines. And who were the guys you were listening to at that time that made you n- not just want to be a guitar player, but be a lead guitar player? Well, Ace was the first one from Kiss. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah, just oh, so many air guitar sessions from, from the time oh. I was a young kid. And it just... That, that was always my favorite part of the song, listening to him. Um, you know, it just, it was so climactic. And then, I, you know, later on, I, I got super into like the, the Ingve Malmsteen type shredders. Could you play like that? Like, did you ever get up to, up to that kind of speed? Because I, I know, I mean, like I said, we're about the same age and I was going through ba- pretty much the same musical evolution at the same time. And when Ingve and that whole thing, I mean, to say nothing of, Eddie Van Halen, but like Ingve, Randy Rhodes, Eddie, all those guys, those were my favorite guitar players, but I was so happy when things kind of went back to basics <laughs> in the mid eighties. Cause I was never going to get there, man. <laughs> I, I, I was close. Uh, like maybe in my, in my area, I was, I was up there, but then, then once I went to Berkeley school of music for a summer program and I met this other kid who was like a super prodigy and I was like, Oh, okay. I guess I'm not not there, uh, but you know I, I was I was pretty good. You can you can hear a lot of my shred bands on YouTube now. Ah, uh, yeah. So you can see I was pretty close. Well, you can even I mean you hear like some of that in this solo for Only in Dreams. I'm mean, not that it's shred, but it is all in that minor um, like not minor pentatonic but minor diatonic where you're using all the notes. You know, which is I think of as yeah. like kind of a um you know i did like obviously that happens in a lot of different kinds of music but it's it happens a lot in heavy metal you know as opposed to like more kind of blues based rock and roll which tends to be more just pentatonic scales yeah as as a kid i was into ace which is the more more the pentatonic thing yeah Uh, but then in the 80s heavy metal became much more classically influenced and you hear the all the notes in the scale and the, the harmonic minor scale. And uh, I, I, at that point I just fell in love with that style and I couldn't turn back. Do you remember what the first lick you learned that made you think, Oh my God, I've got it now. I'm a lead guitar player. Uh, yeah. Probably learning some of those Ingve licks far beyond the sun. Ooh. Dun, dun. That kind of stuff. <laughs> Would you be so kind as to demonstrate one for us if you remember them? Oh, I, I don't know if I do. <laughs> That's where I get kind of. Lost. Oh my good lord! That's amazing, dude. You just whipped that out. It's I love decades. that. I'm not sure if I remember how to play that in like <laughs> That's perfect. Perfect. That might actually be the answer to this next question, but I feel like I know for me, um I have like a grab bag of what I think of as guitar store licks. Like when I walk into a guitar store and I'm testing a guitar to see, <laughs> you know, how the neck feels or how it sounds or whatever, especially if it's plugged in, into an amp, I feel like we all have our sort of go-to things that we do. Do you have a guitar store lick that you would be so kind as to demonstrate? Oh yeah. yeah. Maybe uh, I am a Viking by, by Ingve. <laughs> Okay, how many times have you been in the vintage room at Guitar Center busting that shit out and you look up and there's like 10 dudes with iPhones filming you? I I don't go to Guitar Center, actually. <laughs> I should. <laughs> I should. 
Do you go to Guitar Center a lot? I tell you, it's funny. I went to the last time I went to Guitar Center was not that long ago, and I was with uh, Pat Smear, and we went um, and we're looking at guitars. And it made me laugh so hard because I it was something like I don't remember exactly what the year was, but we were in like the vintage room and there was like a 1998 or something that was like vintage <laughs> Les Paul. It's like, what? How fucking old are we, man? Jesus Christ. That's, That's vintage now for real. Let's talk about uh, 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 let's get into some of the background of of this song. So. Just to set the stage, you guys were making your first record, the uh, legendary blue record. Um, you had Rick Ocasek from the Cars producing. I'm assuming yeah. uh, you guys were big Cars fans. The the record company said we had to have a producer. I didn't want a producer, but they insisted. And one day I was in the grocery store and I heard J Just What I Needed. <laughs> I was like, yeah, that's kind of what I want the Weezer record to sound like. So let's get that guy. And then the synth comes in. It's like, yeah, that's Weezer. Was was the Blue record the first big hit record that Okasik produced? I mean, I, I knew that he had done that Bad Brains record, but outside of that, like what, what other production credits did he have at that time? Yeah, all I knew about was the Bad Brains album. I don't think he had a big hit as a producer. So, I mean, what you just said that, okay, I mean, this is getting way off topic here, but that kind of maybe answers the the production on Pinkerton. Was that you guys having yeah. success and then going, actually, we're not going to have a producer like we always wanted? Exactly. And mix in some of the reaction to the first album's success and the feeling that it was too slick. And I mean, uh, it wasn't just Weezer that had that reaction because so many bands of our generation, they put out a, a, an album blows up and they feel like it's just too slick and produced. We need to that's like some of that 90s alt rock guilt you're talking exa about. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> we got that hard. And uh, so, yeah. Well, we and you it. know, what's really funny about that, dude. Go back and listen to the blue record now compared to what's happened since then. And that, I mean, it sounds like a black flag record. It's the, you know what I mean? It's like, it's not slick at all by modern standards. Yeah. Yeah. I do remember though, that our, our, we had some fans in LA from playing the clubs and their reaction was, was when they heard the album, it's like, wow, it's like, it sounds totally different from you guys. It's totally like this big sound. So I think when, we definitely turned up the professionalism when we made that first record. Sure. I mean, just getting back to that, I'm, I'm going to assume that, uh, that you guys were pretty inexperienced in the studio. And so how involved in like tones and arrangements and amp choices and like how you built your guitar souls and all that stuff did Rick Ocasek get? Uh, well, I wouldn't say I was inexperienced because I had been in band since I was 14 and, you know, made so many demos and, uh, had varying levels of success, but I, I've never been that um, talented or interested in the whole specifics of sounds field or the gear field. And Rick is, was fantastic at it. So I just came, I walked into the studio the first day and basically didn't want anybody to mess with me at all. I have this amazing sound. I knew people with good intentions were gonna try to come in and make it sound more normal. So I was very resistant, but he, he is such a nice guy and very persistent. And by the end of the first week, he had convinced me to change my, like use his guitar, which sounded totally different and use his, um, use different, totally different amp settings, pickup settings. And Wait, okay. So run through all this. What was his guitar versus your guitar and what was okay, the amp so I was, and the pickups and all that stuff? I was on a Strat copy and... Was the, that the, the blue, from, the Warmoth guitar? Yeah, exactly. Okay. I don't know how you knew about that, but that's what I was using. That's what I used all through our club playing days. Sure. But the key was I had put the switch over here on, on the for the rhythm pickup and no no bridge pickup at all. So it just was like all ultra heavy and bassy sounding, which sounds great when you're playing by yourself and you're like, this is huge. Um but in the context of an, an album, when, when you have a bass player, you have another guitar player, and all of these low, frequency, low frequencies covered by other instruments, 
you need a guitar that's like really punchy. So he gave me his um, junior and his special, two Les Pauls, um, I think both from the 50s, and had me switch to the bridge pickup. And I, when I played it by myself, I was, it was like, bam, bam, bam. I was like, that's not the Weezer sound. But when you blend it in with the rest of the band, the whole thing just turns into this, this huge wallop that was super satisfying. And I never would have seen that. And um, I, I'm really grateful to him for that because we've used those guitars, that sound ever since. And was that into like a Big Muff into your Mesa Boogie no. or what? what? No, that was no just pedals. straight in. Really? Yeah. No pedals. No. They're, in fact, the only ef effects on a guitar, I think, are in Only in Dreams. There's a little bit of delay on this, on the, on the swells. Um, but apart from that, I was like very anti effects. So no, no pedals. That is so strange because that your first record, I feel like influenced all of the rest of us to want to go out and buy a big muff. Cause I think everybody thought that that was a big muff. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're clearing that up now. Jesus big muff. Thanks you. So do you, what do you remember about, about that day that you recorded the guitar solo? Um, who else was in the studio with you? Were your bandmates there and, and would they get involved in, in how you put stuff together? Well, the first week we recorded for five or six weeks in electric lady in New York city, which was super exciting. Oh, wow. The first week we did basic tracks. So at that point, only in dreams, by the end of the first week we had, uh, like the drums and the bass and they were, as you hear them now, there was no way to go back and change them later. So Week two, week three goes by, week four. At this point, Rick Ocasek is like, all right, you have like, at the end of this song, you have three minutes of bass and drums playing the same thing over and over and over again. And I don't see what's happening, what's supposed to be happening. <laughs> what the hell? <laughs> and I was like, don't worry, it's going to be amazing. And I had this vision for what it was going to sound like. But for whatever reason, I was I was very resistant to to finishing it. I, I think I was just I knew I knew it was something I was going to have to improvise. There was going to be a lot of trial and error, and I felt awkward with Rick there and with other you know other people around. So I just kept putting it off. And then it became every day. He was like, "Rivers, you got to we got to take care of this part of the song. The rest of the record's almost done. You have this weird three minutes where nothing's going on." I was like, don't worry, it's going to be great. Finally, there was one Sunday where he couldn't come into the studio. So I came in. I had the place to myself. It was just me and the engineer. And I took a couple hours and I'd improvise and go back and improvise till I took a wrong turn and then punch in there. Let's take over from there. And and then that that's how it ended up where it is. And, and I was... I really needed that time by myself to do this kind of work. The rest of the album, we were mostly just recording what how, stuff we already had been playing for a year. I mean, we played these songs hundreds of times over, over the that first year and a half in, in the clubs and in rehearsals. But this this section had required a lot of um, in studio creation. And is that you playing both on the left and the right? Because it sort of yeah. does that long, you're talking about that th whole three minutes. And I'm curious, yeah. and we'll get into it when we get into actually breaking down the solo. I'm curious to hear where, in your mind, the solo starts exactly. Uh, um, but there's that long overlapping, you know, it sounds like either single notey or octaves kind of, you know, not exactly in harmony, but kind of almost like leapfrogging each other, you know? Is that you yeah. doing all that? Yep. I played all the guitar in the album. Oh, you did? Yeah. What's so was Brian not in the band quite? He wasn't yet? in the band yet because there was the original guitar player. I did all the guitar, <clears throat> all the guitars in between the departure of the first guitar player and the arrival of Brian the second. Can we? You mentioned or I mentioned the Blue Warmoth Strat. Can we just drill down on that a little bit? Because that's like people. That's sort of a um, iconic guitar to a lot of people uh, out there in the world. How did that guitar come to be? Did you buy it put together? Did you put it together yourself? Like why? Why humbuckers? You know all that. All that kind of stuff. I had to tell the story of that guitar. Our, that was our first guitar player, Jason. He 
he was very, very good with gear and building things. So he built it for himself. Um, I, I, don't, I really don't know anything about it, <laughs> except that it sounded really, <laughs> it sounded really good and it looks cool. And uh, I, I remember he. So he left he, the band, but he left you his guitar as a token. Yeah. So Weezer originally, even before he joined, the idea was. I was going to play electric guitar. We were going to get a second guitar player who has only played acoustic. So for the first oh, year, wow. he only played acoustic and he built that warm it for himself, but he was, he was the acoustic guy. So I ended up using his guitar because it sounded cooler than my Charvel. <laughs> that would have been a very different look if you'd been playing a Charvel. I mean that, so you, you talk about Jason, the original guitar player leaving sort of in that, in that period, and then Brian coming in, but then also Matt, the original bass player, left a few years later after after Pinkerton and all that. And it got me thinking about, you know, a lot of times in bands, bands start and eventually one person kind of winds up becoming the de facto leader, or the de facto songwriter. They get the, you know, kind of take over the band creatively or whatever. Is that had those roles not really been determined? Is that like, was the process of making that first record when that kind of things fell into place in that way? Yeah. I mean, it definitely started moving in that direction. That being said, it, it all started with me. Like I, uh, first there was no Weezer and I said, all right, I'm going to write 50 songs and I'm going to, I'm going to form a band. And I did that. And I f first partnered up with, with the drummer, Pat and, then we added Jason and finally Matt. Um, so it kind of all started with me, but I think, you know, it, it was definitely, it definitely was a band. Like I, I needed those guys to even get, get off the ground and get going. I wasn't like this super determined leader from, from the start. Um, so does that answer your question? <laughs> it does. Yeah, it's perfect. <laughs> Rivers, are you ready to break this thing down real nice and slow for everybody watching at home? Yeah, I mean, if I can play Ingve, I should be able to play this. <laughs> uh, now, generally speaking, when you're putting together a guitar solo um, in the studio, do you work that stuff out beforehand? Like, do you know what you're going to do when, before you get there? Or do you just kind of noodle around until you hit on something and then refine it? Maybe 50-50. Sometimes I'll, I'll have it totally, totally mapped out. And then it's just a matter of getting great performances. But some, sometimes I go on, it's like, I, I haven't done that work yet. And I do have to do a lot of improvisation and figure out what's going on. At what point did you figure out you were going to go into that more sort of traditional guitar solo bit at the end? I don't know what year you were making that, 1993 or whatever it was. Yeah. Um, like that was uh, uh, in alt rock circles becoming pretty illegal. Yeah. The specific notes were created on that Sunday, but that what happened, the basic idea of what happens there had been in the song during our live shows in the clubs for the last year and a half. Uh, so this may be hard to believe, but when we started out, we were much more like a hippie band. I had long hair and um, I was very into Trey Anastasio from Fish. Oh, wow. I God, I don't hear that at all in Weezer, my friend. You shared that yeah. real quick. All Weezer songs in those days ended like this, where we didn't know how the song ended, so we'd just keep jamming. And I would solo like that. and I Because I, I went to fish shows and had the tapes, and it was like, man, this is this is just so transcendent, the way he plays. And uh, that's kind of what I wanted to do. Now, by the time we made the album with with Rick Ocasek, most of the, those endings got turned into like a normal ending for a song. And cause as you were saying, like the whole jamming thing wasn't super cool at that time, but this, <laughs> this bit survived. And, um, and maybe that's one reason why Rick was anxious about it. It's like, well, what, what's going to happen here? You, right. You, you why are you trying to ruin jammer? this record, man? <laughs> yeah. So, so this song, like a lot of, uh, like most Weezer songs is down to a half step. Um, yeah. what, what led you guys to do that? Is it just to make the guitars sludgier or was that because your vocal fit in there better? It was primarily about the vocal. Like, uh, ever since I was 14 and singing in, in the school choir, I was, I was a big choir geek. Um, 
I, I had this thing about wanting to be able to sing higher and I just couldn't quite sing high enough. I wanted to try out for the all state choir, but I couldn't hit the G that you have to be able to hit, uh, to even audition. So I was always just trying to hit higher notes as a singer. And it was, and then when I started singing in a rock band, uh, when I was around 20, it was the same thing. So I just said, well, what Especially if I in that area, you had to get way up there. Yeah. You know? the, yeah. Yeah. The kind of singers I grew up listening to were like, they could sing incredibly high. So then I had the idea, well, why don't I just lower the, the tuning of the guitar? Then I can hit the note that I want to hit. <laughs> um, and then it was an added benefit that it does ends up sounding sludgier. So let's let's uh, let's nail down exactly because I know we're in my mind the the solo solo starts, but where do you consider the solo starting? Which part are we breaking down here? Because there's that there is that long three minute section. There's like all that sort of single notey stuff, and the drums are building, and then the drums kick in, and it yeah. sounds like it's some uh, overlapping maybe octave stuff that goes on for a bit, and then there's yeah. like a big like flat five nasty note in there. And then the solo starts. I mean, that's how I'm hearing it. But how how do you sort of perceive it? Um, well, if I was going to say to the band, let's take it from the solo, I think I would go... Um, um, I mean, I'd go all the way back to here where it's just it starts with the bass. And then these guitar swells little arpeggiation yeah what is yeah, that what arpeggiation there's some there's some spooky stuff going on there what are you playing can you demo that for us a little bit so that's just a little uh what is that a g major yeah kind of in that d position yeah totally clean and are you moving up doing like a sus four up to the five kind of thing? I don't think so. I think it's, I think I'm just changing chord. Yeah, I'm just changing uh, to a C gotcha. chord. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah. So this, I'm pretty sure, is a Velvet Underground influence. So this is this is one one of the most important records that helped me start thinking in alternative instead of metal, because they have a lot of like these clean arpeggios. So yeah, this this whole part is like a a, a mashup of huge guitars from from metal and then Velvet Underground clean guitars, and that's kind of Weezer in a nutshell, right there. Well, let's let's jump ahead a little bit because it goes through that for qu quite a while with like some you know, all that sort of single notey stuff, and then let's kind of look at it from where the drums kick in after that big long build, and let's talk about what's so, what's going on there. Are those octaves or those single notes at that point? Yeah, those are octaves. Where are you? Uh, where are you fingering that exactly? You're way up here. This is all on the G and high E string. Oh, it's all oh, okay. Oh wow. Yeah. Okay, and what's what's the sort of overlapping part that's coming out? Because like that's coming out the left, right? And then what's coming out the right side? Uh, I'll have to check. Or is that long forgotten? <laughs> <laughs> It'll come right back to me. Okay, well, first of all, first of all, you have the main the main riff underneath it. Which is also okay, so you're playing that like along with the bass, because I also thought that yeah. maybe there was some sort of like. 
you know, E minor inversion noodly bit, but maybe that's that other part that. I could have been just hearing some sort of like, you know, harmonic ear twister that I. Oh, yeah, I, mean, I hear something I mean, on the right. Could, We've just unearthed the Secret Rivers guitar track from 25 years ago. Yeah. Yeah, so I would just, uh, I had the, the main riff underneath and I have the main melody on top. So then I would just kind of look around for some other notes in the middle that would give, that thicken it up and make it sound really tense and emotional. I love how right before it goes into the more traditional Lee part, it's, I think like the right side hits that flat five a little ahead of the left side. So it's this cool build. They like, it gets a little noisy and then it gets a lot noisy. Was that just a, like a happy accident? Let's see. Yeah, I think it just happened and then it sounded cool. <laughs> <laughs> the trick to make the secret to make it a great record it just happened and then it sounded oh, cool that sound it might be oh wow how are you fingering that exactly then so instead of doing the octave yeah. on the flat third i do like a major seven it kind of oh wow oh wow yeah Oh, that's extra noisy. That is and, great. And you kind of, and you bend, but you, but you bend it up so it starts to approach the octave. Oh wow! Yeah, max tension. Max tension. Okay, so let's look. So then, at that point, the left side takes off and does like, and it begins this thing where there's like a kind of a repeated pattern that's almost the same, but not quite. And then it goes a little higher and does another repeated pattern that's almost the same, but not quite. This is the way that I heard it. I'm curious to see if I landed it anywhere near you. I heard something along the lines of. Is it something like that? Very close, yeah. Okay, so you're not, I was adding like a little trill thing, but it's more of a bend. Yeah. And just for the people listening at home, that is, uh, you're up there in the minor pentatonic box up at the 12th fret, and you're doing kind of a, it's like, it's like pentatonic and diatonic kind of at the same time with the flat five thrown in there. Yeah. And then nice. So uh, uh, what's and what does it do for the next section? This the way I heard it was like a bend up here to the fifth. Yep, exactly. Oh, sweet. Will you please demo that for us, sir? When you get up to that part, that's where it gets like to me. Um, and I don't know if this was an influence on you or not, but even your your a your note choices, but also your hand vibrato uh, it is reminiscent of Brian May. Was Brian May uh, an influence on your guitar playing? Because that was the first thing that I thought of when I was listening back to this yesterday. I definitely liked Queen when I was a kid, but I don't remember ever playing Queen songs. Uh, so I, I don't know. I, I don't. It must be he and I were influenced by the same things, maybe. I, I don't know how that happened. That's a really interesting thing. Like, like vibrato is is oftentimes like, uh, I don't know, how do I say this politely? Like, it's like a giveaway of somebody that's not a very good guitar player. That's like the, mm -hmm. in, 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 in my 
opinion. You know what I mean? Like the guys that don't have great vibrato is always like, oh man, why do you got to do that in the middle of all that? And that, and you have like, you have like a really nice, you know, natural, it's like something, I don't know if that's something you can teach people or if you just have to kind of intuitively do it. I don't know. Yeah. I think, I think it does, must have something to do with, with, uh, you know, the, your nerves it, between you, between your brain and your fingers and how all that's wired up. Can you, can we, let's, let's just sort of break that end bit down a little bit um, for the listeners at home. How are you fingering it? Exactly. It looked like you were doing it a little bit different than, than I was for the, for the next part. Like when you get up into, and even the. Okay. So it looks like I'm always bending the first note up a step. Okay. I mean, sorry. The high, and the you're up, high. you're way up there on like, what is that? The 20th fret or something? Or if that's like a, what the 17th fret? On the uh, high E. 15, 17. Yeah, I'm bending up the 17th. Uh, now, I can, if I think about it, I can't remember how I was. <laughs> yeah, so I stay in this position. That's nice. Yeah, one slight difference is I strike the note before I release the bend, so it goes. Oh, yeah, nice. Style point. Yeah. yeah. Nice, and then it just drifts off into the night. Yeah. Now, that to Beautiful. me is kind of fish fishy. Really? Um, yeah. So I was hearing all that diatonic stuff. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm to be perfectly honest, I'm not super familiar with, with the, their music or their style exactly. But um, that I was hearing like that's a, you know I'm hearing a little Judas Priest or some Iron Maiden or something. Again, <laughs> you yeah, know? yeah, that to that too. <laughs> I bet, I bet, uh, I bet Trey played some of that music. Probably. There's a yeah. funny thing with like jam band and heavy metal where I feel like, and I don't know this to be a fact, but I feel like a lot of guitars that were maybe invented for jam band hippie music got, uh, got, got like adopted and taken over <laughs> by heavy metal guys. Like, and you could like imagine, you know, that crazy guitar that uh, Jerry Garcia played. It was like all wood, you know, I don't like know a weird shape. Oh yeah. He has just some crazy shape. And I always thought like, if you painted like a skull and crossbones or made that like alligator skin, that would be like Randy Piper from Waspy rocking that thing. Uh -huh. No problem. You know what I mean? Some weird overlap there in scene. All right, let's get into some fan questions, man. You broke that down wonderfully. I love that. Thanks. Oh, it was so fun to play that. Is that one that's still in your set? Like, is that still like if I go see Weezer, you know, this summer, will will we be seeing that? Yes. Well, it hasn't been for many years, but this uh, this is our first like real headline tour in a long time. So we have a much longer set, and we're gonna we're gonna get to play this song in its entirety. And I, uh, fans' minds will be blown. Okay, uh, jumping into fan questions, and we already addressed it. There were a lot, too many to like write down, but a lot of people asked about your tone, but it was really specifically seemed to always focus on a big muff, which you have now told me was not a thing. No, I had one when I when I was fourteen or fifteen to play Crazy Train, and it was fun, but I haven't used it since. Is that still in like a closet at your mom's house somewhere or something? No. <laughs> That's all I, yeah i just i don't i don't i don't use effects okay good to know let's jump in here then uh this is a pretty hard-hitting question mac mox bass wants to know randy or eddie randy oh really yeah you're a randy guy i'm a huge randy guy yeah uh i mean it's unfortunate because it's such such a short career but yeah uh, definitely it's way more my style Interesting. Yeah, I, I I was thinking for this show, it might be fun to go find, you know, it's this the whole concept of the show that we're doing right now was well, I watched so many people on YouTube explain how to play like Eddie Van Halen solos or Randy Rhodes solos. And, there, and there's a lot of really great people out there, but they're all a little bit, you know, a little bit not really what it was because it's not the person. So like, you know, if you could go to the source, but for guys like that, that you can't go to the source, I thought it'd be fun to go find like the best guy on YouTube that does Randy Rhodes and interview him about like a Randy Rhodes solo. I don't know. 
that person mm. might be you, Rivers. You might have to come back and do that. <laughs> okay, next up. This is two people's questions, but to me, they're kind of related, so I'm going to stick them together. Dennis Warren Alves asks, uh, is it true you went to GIT in Hollywood and are a secret shredder? And then The Saunders Music asks, where is the shred record? I was registered to go to GIT in, in, the, in March of 89, and that's when I moved out to Hollywood with my band. Uh, I... And that's how that's why my parents supported me for that first year. Uh, I'm ashamed to say that I didn't actually go to class very much, and I got <laughs> I got expelled. By the way, that was a pretty common thing. My my buddy Bill did the exact same thing. Like, mom, I'm going to college. What do you yeah. mean? Pay for it? Yeah, um, my parents were so supportive, man. I, I <laughs> you know, getting me guitars and paying for my first year out here. It's I, I really appreciate it. I'm, yeah, I'm glad nice. I was able to turn out, turn into something for him. Oh, that's sweet, man. That is seriously sweet. Along those lines, Am Music 901 wants to know, and I've never heard this rumor, so I don't know if this is true, but is it true that you auditioned for Megadeth? No, I, I never, I've never heard that rumor before. <laughs> Would you audition for Megadeth? I guess is the follow-up <laughs> question. No, I, I think there's... Uh, uh, you know, generations of guitar players that are much more suitable for that now. <laughs> I don't know. I saw those Ingve licks, bro. <laughs> I don't know. All right. Tom A. Wright Artist wants to know, there's a bunch of stuff on the Blue album, and I can't work it out if it's Harmonizer or Overdubs. Was that stuff Rick's idea, or was it in there already? Uh, I'm guessing it's not a Harmonizer, because you have very clearly stated you're not an effect pedal guy. Yeah, no no effects. Um I'd be curious to know what part he's talking about. I don't, I don't hear anything that sounds like a harmonizer. Um, yeah, I think even then I, I would really try to, to use overdub sparingly. I'm, well, first of all, we just had 24 tracks, so there wasn't much room to add overdubs, but you know, even then I wanted to, I wanted it to sound realistic. Like, okay, there's the first guitar player. There's a second guitar player. There's the bass and drums and that's the band. So I was trying to do that. Of course, sometimes I couldn't resist the urge to throw in a little harmony here or there. And maybe you guys got there even more so on Pinkerton. I and mean, what is your relationship? This is me asking, not a fan, but like, what is I? What's your sort of view of Pinkerton and how that record? You know, the difference between how it was maybe received in real time versus the the way the legend has grown over the years. Oh yeah, I mean, uh, I, I was devastated when it came out, and uh, it. It did so poorly commercially, critically, um, fan reaction is just a huge disaster. And it was so, it was so personal that I felt like it was, I had steered everybody in a like career ending direction. So I felt <laughs> bad at the time, needless to say. And it took five years for us to, for, for me to, to get up the confidence to put out another record. But now I listen to it and I can recognize like, wow, that's like, there's some serious emotion going into those performances, and I, I really love it. There's, there's nothing. And quite people like that love record. it. It's like probably, yeah. I would guess for a lot of Weezer fans, it's probably their favorite record. So, in it's like, it's a, it's an interesting thing to have made something that has changed so the the sort of the perception of it has changed so dramatically over the years. And by the way, in real time, there were people, and I was one of them, that fucking loved that record and thought it was amazing. So you know, there there was that too. You know. Yeah, um, I don't remember those people. I, I know of one person that's, that loved the record. Russell Simmons, the drummer from the John Spencer Blues Explosion, mm. put it on his year-end list for 96. But I never encountered anyone like yourself who, who said they really liked it at the time. I mean, I was playing in a band called No Use for a Name that was more of a punk rock thing at that point. It seemed like everybody in that scene loved that record. Hmm. Which then made sense later on because, you know, you guys kind of sat it out for a minute and I think maybe you went back to school. But when you guys came back and I remember when you, I think you did like the Warp Tour or something. Yeah. It was one of the first things you did when you guys came back and people were just fucking stoked. Like in that world. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Like that, that was that was a big deal. I remember saying, what the fuck? They're doing the Warp Tour? Holy shit. Yeah. But, but I was... I didn't know about that world in 96. Um, and then it, w and then I was very isolated. So I didn't hear from anyone. It was one of my, one of my friends came back from his tour 
in 99, and he said, <clears throat> you know, there's a new genre called emo, and all these kids love, these emo kids love Pinkerton. I was like, what? What's that? And that's when it started to turn around for us. I feel like I saw you guys around that time of the Green Album with um, maybe like the Get Up Kids opened up or something. Did you guys tour with the Get Up Kids? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. yeah. 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 I think I saw that show in New York. Keith Jackson wants to know, and this is the final question. Have you ever been approached about doing a signature guitar by anyone? And when, it, when I read that, I was like, wait, how does Rivers not have like 10 signature models at this point? No, I haven't. Um, but I love signature models. Like for acoustic, I, um, no, for, for, uh, my wah pedal, I use, um, the guy from Creed, which is his name? Mark uh, Tremonti. Oh yes. Yeah. 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 Oh, does yeah. he have like a signature wah? Yeah. And for, acoustic, well, you, get, you I gotta have like the signature Eddie EV8, you know, the Eddie Van Halen phaser, right? No. I have the Ed Sheeran signature acoustic that I use. Um, so yeah, I'd love to do one. Yeah, it's weird. We don't have any of that. And like, uh, like you're saying with, with your line six stuff or an Ableton, like guitar rig, they don't have any Weezer sound. So really? when I'm making, yeah, when I'm making demos, I have to use like Blink 182 or Foo Fighters. <laughs> <laughs> how is there not something called like you know the the uh the pinkerton plug-in or the the blue record plug-in exactly. or something like that yeah i have to use the, it's called foo monkey ultra that's what i use for all for my real? yeah <laughs> that's amazing <laughs> wow rad wow it's probably pretty close um I'm going to um, I'm going to call my guy at Fender. I'm going to be like, dude, what are you doing? Why isn't there a, a Rivers model? Because I'll tell you, yeah. on, like, seriously, this is my Chris Shiflett model right here. And the reason that this came together is because I built one of these with Warmoth parts. I mean, it's oh. like tailor made for you. You yeah. just can do the exact same thing. Amazing. All right, buddy. I, you have been uh, you have been wonderful today. Thanks for sitting and doing this with me. I really, really appreciate it, man. You're great. This is super fun and uh, hope to see you on the road sometime soon. Yeah. All right, that was Rivers Cuomo from Weezer. I think personally that's my biggest takeaway because I can't play that Malmsteen stuff, but I can definitely do that, and you're going to hear me do that every night on tour from now on. <laughs> Yeah, Rivers Cuomo pro move. I dig that. Make sure you learn the solo and post videos of your version of it and tag me in it. Hashtag shred with shifty and we will make fun of you on a later episode. And while you're at it, make sure you follow us at volume.com slash shifty where all the full video versions of our show live. And we'll see you very soon. Yeah, baby. Shred with Shifty is created and hosted by me, Chris Shiflett, and produced in partnership with Double Elvis, Volume.com, and Premier Guitar. If you're digging the show, make sure you hit that follow or subscribe button so you get our new episodes when they come out every other week. Volume.com is a free platform with live stream performances, concert broadcasts, and a video archive that includes performances by Brothers Osborne, Stone Temple Pilots, Dirks Bentley, Weezer, and more. Shred with Shifty is produced by Jason Shadrick. Our executive producers are Brady Sadler and Jake Brennan for Double Elvis. Engineering support by Matt Tahaney and Matt Bowden. Our video editors are Dan DeStefano and Addison Savan. Special thanks to Chris Peterson, Greg Necron, and the entire Volume.com crew. Adios, amigos.